people of God say amen once again. Do me a favor one time. Uh, just look to your neighbor. Say neighbor. neighbor. Say neighbor. neighbor. There's no better place to be, no be. than in the house of the Lord with me. Lord. Turn to your other neighbor. Say neighbor. neighbor. Say neighbor. neighbor. There is no better place to be, no be. than in the house of the Lord with me. Let the people of God say amen one more time in this house. Y'all, I am so grateful once again to be up here in front of you uh, to deliver God's word once again. Um, it has been a great, great weekend, y'all. Y'all don't understand just how much I feel lifted just by being here amongst God's people. Um, and not only that, I am enjoying myself so much seeing that the youth are so involved and so engaged on today. Can y'all give the youth a hand right quick? Can y'all please give the youth a hand right quick? You do not find that very often in every, everywhere in the churches of Christ where youth are actually involved and engaged for God. That is a rarity, and I'm so grateful for God's blessing is covering um, over this wonderful event. Um, I thank you so much for receiving me the way that you have. I, there's very few places I can go where I can come into a church and be treated like family instantly. And I'm so grateful uh, that you have taken me in like that, and I can safely say that I feel at home here in Wichita Falls. Amen. I want to thank you. I want to thank God uh, for waking me up on this morning because I know there's a lot of people out there who are standing before him right now who didn't. And I also want to thank God for allowing me to make it here safely, and I want to thank God really just for the minister of this church, uh, Brother Smith. Y'all ought to give Brother Smith a hand right quick as well. Y'all re really ought to give Brother Smith a hand right quick, y'all. As a matter of fact, if you can stand up and give your pastor a standing ovation, if, you can, if you're able to give him a standing ovation, you ought to thank God for having such a man of God like this in this church, doing the type of work he's doing in this, type, in this community. Brother Smith is a rarity, y'all. There's not many men of his stature who will give one of us little guys a shot to come up here and just, you know, do God's work. So I'm so grateful to God for him. I'm thankful to God that I'm able to come here and just do what God has built me for. Uh, it's such a blessing to walk in your calling, y'all. I'm trying to tell you, there's no better feeling in the world than preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So with that said, if you have your copy of God's word, I want to go ahead and jump into this thing. Um, I had something else planned for this morning. I had something else planned. However... The Lord outranks me. <laughs> the Lord outranks me by a lot, and so therefore he moved me to uh, touch on a different subject on this morning, if that's all right with everyone here today. If you have a copy of God's Word, let's turn to Exodus chapter 32, and we we'll begin reading at verse number 25. Exodus chapter 32, we'll begin reading at verse number 25, and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. And the Bible says, And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, 
put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from the gate to gate throughout the camp. And each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. Briefly uh, on this Sunday, I want to share with you a topic called, Whose Side Are You On? Whose Side Are You On? Pray with me right quick. Father God, we just come to you right now thanking you for another day of life, dear God. We thank you so much for allowing us to come here and just worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for just all your blessings, all the many blessings you have given us. Lord, I pray that you would uh, cover me as I preach your word, dear God, and I pray that you would have a blessing upon the hearers of your word today, dear God, and just, if it be your will, let someone make the right decision to choose you today, dear God, uh, and put you on in baptism and be a part of your family on today, dear God. In Jesus' name, we do pray and ask all things. Amen. I woke up this morning with my mind, my mind was set on. Lord, I woke up this morning with my mind, my mind was saved Oh, the Lord, I woke up this morning with my mind, my mind was saved Oh, Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah I woke up this morning, said I woke up this morning with my mind was set on. Anybody here woke up this morning with my, my mind was set. I woke up this morning, said I woke up this morning with my mind, my mind was set on. Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, say glory. Hallelujah, I'm walking and talking, I will be walking and talking, every day my mind is set on, Lord, I am walking and talking, every day my mind is set on the Lord, walking and talking, I will be walking and talking, every day my mind is set on. Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You can't hate your neighbor, say you can't hate your neighbor. With your mind, your mind is set on. You can't hate your neighbor, you can't hate your neighbor. With your mind needs to be set on the Lord. Your neighbor, with your mind, your mind is set. Oh, Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, say glory, hallelujah. I woke up this morning, said, I woke up this morning, and my mind, my mind is set. Jesus, I woke up 20 by 7, 365, my mind is set upon the Lord. Lord, I woke up this morning when, when my mind said, Oh, Jesus, glory, hallelujah, hallelujah, oh, glory, hallelujah. If y'all don't get anything from today's message, I want y'all to remember one thing and one thing in particular. Being dedicated to the Lord is a daily choice. Sometimes it will be a tough daily choice. 
because when you talk about being dedicated to God, you're talking about being dedicated to him alone as opposed to being dedicated to someone else. And one thing I thought about when I was looking at this passage was that when we all decided and agreed to serve God and God alone at the expense of our closest friends and family members, it was kind of a tough decision. Because those of us who had, how many of us actually have some friends? I know some of the kids here don't have that many, but how many of us actually have friends? At least one. Like you got that one bestie that, you know, that's your ride or die, your raw dog, your ace, boon, coon, all that. You got that one friend. Everybody has that one friend. But sometimes that one friend can be a hindrance from the Lord. And when you talk about being dedicated to God, you have to be willing to give up that one friend so you can get your blessing. And of course it's not easy when we do this, especially when we're suffering. Because when we suffer, we tend to surround ourselves with people, places, and things that we shouldn't surround ourselves with. Because for some reason, pain you know, makes us feel that we, should, we are able to do certain things, and obviously that's just not the case. But when it comes to serving God better, living for God better, and receiving God's blessings, there's a lot we'll actually be willing to do. And there's also a lot that we will be willing to sacrifice for our blessing from God. And honestly, I'm going to tell you the real truth. When, it talks, when we're talking about being dedicated to God, sometimes it's actually going to take us falling down in a mighty way for us to really assess and figure out whose side we're really on. So three, three quick points I want to give you on today, and after that, I'm going to take my seat and let you do your business with God. The first point I want to make is they chose. They chose, or they made a choice. Look at verses uh, 25 and 26. It says, And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision or the humiliation of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. Now listen, let me, let me set this thing up for you right quick. What we have here is a combination of many things that have gone wrong when it comes to the people of God. Moses is leading a group of Hebrews who just got liberated uh, from Egypt. And since they've been delivered from Egypt, they have been falling short. I know that doesn't sound like much of a, uh, much different from what happens now today because if you look around you, a lot of God's people are falling short nowadays. A lot of God's people are doing things that they ought not to do nowadays. And they have been taken out of Egypt and since they've been in the wilderness, they have been grumbling, complaining, you know, plotting and everything like that in um, chapter 15 verse 24, uh, chapter 16 verses 2 and 3, and verses 17 verses 2 and 3, they've been grumbling and, you know, murmuring behind Moses and, Moses and Aaron's back. And, of course, when God, you know, basically tells them, hey, you have to be in the wilderness for a while, verse, uh, chapters 18 through 22, they've been waiting on a blessing. And because they are waiting, they're actually, Moses himself actually went up to the mountain to talk to God. And while he's up there, he's up there for a while. If you look back in those uh, scriptures I just mentioned, the Israelites are starting to get kind of tired of waiting on him. Have y'all ever waited on a blessing from God and it seems like God is moving really slow with it? And so while they're up there waiting on Moses to give them a message from God, you know, give them, you know, basically a sermon, you know, to get them through this tough time they're going through, they get tired of waiting and they start engaging in idol worship or worshiping gods that are not even real. And Moses, when he saw this, he's like, wow, they have broken loose. That broken loose is basically a description of, y'all done lost y'all ever love in mind. Like Moses over there standing at the gate like, are you serious right now? After all, I done brought y'all up. Okay, you know what? And so Moses is saying, you know what? Who is faithful to God? If y'all don't know what faithful means, faithful is just a stronger word that means dedication. Faithful to God means that you will actually do what pleases God even if it costs you everything. And so Moses called only the faithful who chose to serve a God they didn't even hear from when others chose the golden calf. And those who are truly for the Lord 
choose to be faithful and patient in tribulation. I love what it says in Matthew 5, um, 14 through 16, when it talks about, you know, a city set on a hill can't be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a bushel. Because when you are being a light in a dark world, you don't have an option of covering yourself up. You have to be a Christian, a faithful Christian, even though you are probably going through so much turmoil in your life. Because I'm here to tell you, especially the young people, I told you this yesterday, I'm going to tell it to you again. When you, as you get older, you are going to face challenges. You are going to face challenges that actually test your faith. There's people out there right now who face one challenge too many, and now they don't even show up at church no more. And I'm not talking about just young people, I'm talking about grown-ups now. I'm talking about people who are like 50 and above have lost their faith because they have gone through something. And I'm gonna like I said before, suffering makes us feel entitled to sin. It makes us feel entitled to sin, and that's one of the devil's tricks that he uses when he plays on our pain. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, sin or faithfulness is our choice. I hate it when people say, you know, the devil made me do it. The devil didn't make you do nothing. The devil, while, while he is a very powerful being, because if y'all recall, you know, the story of the Garden of Eden, you know, the devil tricked Eve into eating the apple. But he didn't make her eat the apple. Y'all see what I'm saying? The devil actually has more power than all of us. He has more power than you because he knows more than you. He's smarter than you. Smarter than all of us. He has more power than you. But the devil will never have power over you. Devil can't make us do anything. Everything is our choice. The same way the devil can't make us do anything, God can't make you be faithful to him. You got to choose. You know, as, um, as the Bible says, choose ye this day whom you will serve. Every day you have to make a choice to be faithful or to not to be. Second point I want to make is, after the, you've heard us say that they chose, my second point that I want to make is that they rose, or that they rose to the occasion. Look at verse 27 and 28. It says, and he said to them, thus says the Lord of God of Israel, put your sword on your side, each of you go to and fro from the gate to gate through the camp, and ki each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. Now, here's what's happening right here. Moses just asked the faithful members, faithful people of God, to do something unnatural. These men had immediate family members overtaken by sin. And these family members, these close friends and family members that are overtaken by sin, they had to cut them off. Now, understand, what, understand what's, what, why this is such a, a really difficult sacrifice for them. Those who, study, those who are students of the Bible will know that the family dynamic, especially in the Old Testament, is very serious. If there's anybody that you are not going to kill, it's somebody in your own family or in your house. So when Moses is saying, hey, I need you all, if you're really truly faithful to God, I want you to go out there and kill every close friend and family member you see who is engaging in this idol worship. Because that's the only way I'm going to be able to test your faithfulness. And sometimes when it comes, when you're talking about being faithful to God, it's going to require you to do something that's not natural to you. Something that you haven't actually done before in your life. Something that you really, quite honestly, don't want to do. There are plenty of times where I don't want to take the high road when someone's telling me about myself. There are a few four-letter words that I would like to use when someone's getting on my last black nerve. Like I told y'all, when I was driving up here yesterday, I had to go through, you know, a few accidents. You know, I, had to, I was stuck in traffic with some people who can't drive. A few four-letter words went through my mind. I really wanted to tell somebody to move Y'all know, if y'all know that song, y'all know that word. Yeah, get out the way. That's what I wanted to do. 
I don't want to just keep my mouth closed when I see something going on that I don't like. And I just, there's things that you're going to have to do when you have to be faithful. Brother Smith, do me a favor. Do me a favor. Get me uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and 33. Because while there's things you want to do, there's also people you have to be willing to get rid of. When you're talking about your relationship with God. Because there are people who actually will get in your way. Get for me uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and 33, and then I'm going to ask you to jump over to 1 Corinthians 5 um, in a second. But 1 Corinthians 15 33, if you have it, go ahead and read. Do not be deceived. Mm hmm. Evil mm hmm. Now, other versions of the Bible will say evil company or bad company will corrupt good morals. Which means, and this is really fair, not just the young people, everybody, there are people out there who know that you are very impressionable, know that you will do anything just to keep them around, and they will utilize that to their advantage. Because bad company, people who aren't for God, they are going to corrupt you. And if you do not want to be corrupted, you have to be willing to cut them off. And I'm going to say something else. The people who will corrupt you, all of them are not outside of the church. In case y'all didn't hear me, everybody who will corrupt you and corrupt your good morals are not outside of the church. Some of them you have seen at some of these church events. Some of them are actually up here holding up here in the pulpit, you know, yelling about God. But I'm not going to say any names because I just ain't, I ain't in that business. But do me a favor, uh, Brother Smith. Go ahead and get for me First Corinthians, First Corinthians five, right quick. First Corinthians five, and read for me eleven through thirteen. <laughs> Listen, what, that, what, what Paul is trying to get the church of Corinth to understand right there is this. We have to be willing to disfellowship from anyone who puts our salvation in jeopardy. Anyone who stands between us and getting to heaven needs to move. Because at the end of the day, after all the pain and suffering that we have been through, out of all the times we have been faithful to God, I will not allow anybody to get in between me and going to heaven. Everybody has to have that mindset to disfellowship or not have any type of relations with someone in the church or not who's getting in the way of us getting to heaven. We have to disfellowship from those type of people, Brother Smith. And I'm going to tell you something else. It doesn't take a letter to do that. All those, you know, who know about, you know, the letters of disfellowship that go around understand what I'm talking about. You don't need to write a letter to say, I don't want to hang out with you no more. You just have to say, you know what? You're bad for business. And you got to move on. Last point. Last point I want to make is we've heard, we saw that they chose, they chose God. They rose to the occasion. Last point I want to make is that they won. They won their blessing. Look at verse number 29. We're going to wrap this thing up. And Moses said, today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord. Each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. Now, when he told them this, mind you, the people in the Bible are just as human as we are. He told, how many of us have siblings here? Raise your hand if you have a sibling. I have a sister, and now, as of... A few days ago, I actually have a brother-in-law now, so we all have siblings. Can y'all imagine, 
I don't know if I should ask the young people this, but how many of y'all can think, how many of y'all have ever thought about killing your sibling before? There's only two kids who are being honest. <laughs> Make that five. Let me go ahead and raise my hand so people won't feel so bad. Have you, like, have you ever thought about killing your sibling? Imagine if you actually had to do it, though. And imagine how you would feel afterwards. When you wake up and realize, oh man, my brother is gone. Or imagine killing your best friend. You know, your bestie that, that you love so dearly that you'd be taking all these little selfies with and everything on your birthday and be like, that's my best friend. Imagine, that, imagine having to kill that person and cut them off. And so when Moses is telling them, hey, today you've been ordained for the service of the Lord, he's probably talking to a bunch of people who are crying their eyes out right now. Like I can just imagine the tears that they have after what they just did. Because each person sacrificed the most important part of their life, which is their family and their friends. They, served the, they sacrificed the most important people in their lives to serve God and receive his blessings. Because I love what it says in, um, give, Brother Smith, give for me uh, Luke chapter 14. Give me Luke chapter 14 and verse number 27. Because that's something we have to be willing to do if we want our blessing. If we want to be pleasing to God and get a blessing. That's a, that's a, double, that's a double barrel right there for us. There's, it's one thing to be pleasing to God, but it's another thing to actually get blessed by him. But, uh, Brother Smith, read for me Luke 14 and 27. Whoever does not bear his cross mm -hmm. and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intended to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost? Mm-hmm. Now, anytime you see in that passage or in Luke 9, 23, when Jesus said, if a man come after me, let him take up his cross daily, take up his cross daily and follow me. When you see the word cross in the New Testament, the main thing you want to think about is sacrifice. And not just sacrifice, sacrifice knowing you're not going to get what's owed you, especially not all the time. Because when Jesus went on the cross, yeah, he got, he was killed, obviously. Well, he died. He actually wasn't killed. If you look in the passages, you'll see that Jesus actually gave up his ghost. Humankind was actually not actually able to kill him. But that's a whole other lesson. We can deal with that another time when I come back. But Jesus rose up from the grave, ascended into heaven. And since he's ascended into heaven, Jesus has not been given what he deserves. This worship that we gave him, we had a good time here on today, haven't we? We've had a good time, haven't we? Okay, if y'all didn't, then I did. I had a great time in Wichita Falls. Shoot. But Jesus, since then, has not been given the amount of glory that's owed him. The amount of worship that's owed him. The amount of dedication that is owed him. And when you talk about being pleasing to God and bearing your own cross daily, you have to understand that you're going to have to sacrifice and whatever blessing you're hoping for, understand that it's more than likely not going to come immediately. It's not, every time, matter of fact, when you go to work, those of you who have jobs, you know, when we go to work, we expect a paycheck, don't we? But every day we go to work, we don't expect a paycheck that day, do we? We just work and work, work diligently, you know, in hopes for that paycheck. 
And some of us, of course, if that paycheck is slow getting there, we ain't going to be too happy, are we? Especially with all the bills that we got. All the bills and all the student loans and everything that we have to pay. We need that check, don't we? And so when we're talking about serving God and winning a blessing, the only way, the surefire way to get a blessing is actually to serve him, even if it seems like he's being silent. Hey, y'all have a pray to God for something, and it seemed like he just wasn't coming through because he didn't come through right when you wanted him. And I love how the songwriter says, you know, he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Y'all know how that last part goes, right? He may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. That's the type of God we serve. Only those on the Lord's side were blessed because they sacrificed for God. Uh, do me a favor. Uh, get for me, Brother Smith, get for me Romans 12 and 1. That's a, that's a very familiar passage for a lot of us. Romans 12 and 1. And after that, I'm going to have you read 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 21. But get for me first Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. I want to show you all everybody how to get a blessing from God. Romans 12 and 1, if you have it, go ahead and read. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will now, before he reads 2 Timothy uh, 2 and 21, I want, you, I want to briefly explain what that, pa what that passage is saying. What that passage is saying, when it says a living sacrifice, I'm here to let y'all know something. When you are dead, when we die, there is nothing more we can do for God. If we were unfaithful throughout our entire lives, if we didn't take our relationship with God seriously while we were living, when we are dead, it is over. He says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice because dead sacrifices can do nothing. They can do nothing anymore. And it's important now, starting young, while you're young, being dedicated to God and taking your spiritual life seriously. Why am I saying that to the young people in particular? Because in case y'all haven't paid attention to the news, young people are dying. There are children out there, especially the ones who come from my neighborhood, who are blessed to see 15 years old. Because most kids end up dying at age 14. Whether it be from gang violence, whether it be from illness, whether it be from anything, young people are dying. And so it starts when you're young. You know the whole passage of train up a child in the way they should go and when they're old they should not depart from it? Older people, we got to start doing something about that. We actually got to start following that scripture. Because when we see our young people grow up and they're not growing up, you know, being dedicated to God, a part of that failure is on us. Because one thing I hated about how I grew up is that when I was young, when I was y'all's age, and I, there was someone up here preaching at a youth Sunday and everything. They would always say, oh, you young people, all y'all want to do is this, that, and then, and the other, and all. And they're just pointing the finger at us, making us feel, trying to make us feel bad about something we probably didn't even do. And I'm thinking to myself, you probably don't even know what's going on in my life in the first place. So I'm not going to say that you guys are doing anything wrong, because I actually don't know. But what I do know, based off the evidence, which is you guys being here today, is that you're actually doing something right. And, and older people, I think we ought to start, you know, magnifying what they do right as opposed to always being held, hung up on what they do wrong. You know, we always love complaining about all oh, the youth are like this, the youth are like that. How about we start saying, you know what, I'm actually glad y'all are actually doing something good. Amen. Why not say, hey, keep up the good work for a change. Brother Smith, go ahead and get for me uh, 2 Timothy 2.21. I need to wrap this thing up. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, 
faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing they generate strife. Mm -hmm. And as a servant of the Lord, must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are not in opposition. But God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. All right. Now, what Paul's trying to tell Timothy is this. If a man cleanses himself of everything that is holding him back from the Lord's will, that's the guy that God's going to use. That's the guy that God's going to bless, male or female. So if you want to win a blessing... You have to be willing to cleanse yourself, cleanse your life from all those people and all those things that are holding you back from the Lord. Because at the end of the day, when we die, those friends that, you know, we think we got to hold on to and everything, we don't answer to them. We don't stand before them. We're not going to go before our friends and our family and have them decide if we make it to heaven or not. We're going to stand before God and he's going to look at us and he's going to recall everything we did in our lives. And so I say all that to say this. If you're not on the Lord's side, you need to get on the right side. If you're not on the Lord's side, you need to get on the Lord's side. And if you really want to be pleasing to God and be on his side, what better way to be on his side than to be in his family? I'm just saying, what better way to be, to be on the Lord's side than to be in his family? And it's real simple. You just have to come hearing, believing, repenting, confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you can get baptized and be in God's family today. Now, I know this is something that actually happened a few years back. Had a young lady who decided, hey, you know what, I want to put the Lord on in baptism, but... I want to wait until my mother gets here so she can see this. And I told her, I said, I understand that. I mean, my mother was there at my baptism and everything. But what if something happens before your mother gets here? You know, whatever it is that might be holding anyone back from being put down in the water grave of baptism and added to God's body, Whatever it is that you're waiting for, you need to not wait much longer. You can, you can secure a spot in heaven today just by going down in the water. Just by going down in the water. Like, does any, does any, who here actually wants to go to heaven? Who actually wants to go? I mean, if you don't want to go, hey, you no, know, I'll, I'll be praying for you. Because I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> But if you really want heaven, you can secure a spot right now. Those of you who are already in God's, in God's family, like I said yesterday, if there's something that you got going on that is a hindrance to you, maybe it's hurting you, whatever pain you got going on, it's time for you to let that go. It's time for you to give it to God and not try to bear it by yourself no more. And like I said before, nobody's going to judge you. No one's going to look at you sideways. No one's going to look at you funny. Everybody stand to your feet. One thing, I, um, one thing that I love about being a Christian is that I have family everywhere, all over the world. And since we are family, I believe families should always lift up one another. So... I say all that to say this, for anyone who might be contemplating, asking for prayer, or giving a testimony, or coming up for baptism, do not be afraid to have everyone here as your family member. If you're wanting to be baptized on today, if you're scared of walking up here and saying, oh, well, I want to be baptized, and I want to, you know, give myself to God fully, if you're nervous about that, if you actually just motion at me or whatever, I should walk up here with you. I don't care what people think about me today. 
All right, a bunch of church people staring at me is not a problem. This is actually the life I plan on living for the rest of my life. Yeah, and don't let, and I'm going to say this too, don't let, you know, what is it, probably three minutes, three minutes of people looking at you stop you from going to heaven. Because that's really all it's going to take for Brother Smith to take your confession and then take you in the back to get you ready for baptism. Three minutes of all these eyes looking at you, seeing that you don't have it all together, just to make it to heaven. That's three minutes compared to eternity. Why would you pass that up? And not only that, everybody who has been baptized, go ahead and raise your hand right quick, everyone who's been baptized. Everyone who's, look around you. Those of you who don't have your hands up, look around you. Even if you have your hands up, look around. Everybody with their hands up right now had to come down and do the exact same thing. They had to come down and do the exact same thing. They didn't, we didn't all have it all together. That's what baptism is for. That's what baptism is all about. That's what being added to God's body is about. He's saying he wants people who don't have it all together. And just for the record, you're, you will not secure a spot in heaven just by showing up here every Sunday. You won't secure a spot in heaven just because you're a nice person. You only secure a spot in heaven by actually doing what God asks of you. That's the whole basis of this lesson was today. Today is to let everybody know you don't win a blessing from God unless you do what he says. And the only thing you're going to have to sacrifice is your former life. The former life you really probably don't even want. So if that's you, feel free to come down and put him on in baptism and be a part of God's family. It's not going to hurt you. The water is actually not going to hurt you. It looks pretty comfortable, too, to be honest with you. Shoot, if I wasn't already baptized, I might get baptized today. And if whoever has anything on your heart, whatever it is, I encourage you, I urge you, I beg you to go ahead and release that burden and let the Lord carry it. Because the Lord is the only person strong enough to handle such a burden. So God bless you. So whoever it is, come down and make your request known as we stand and as we sing the song of invitation. Open the portals of heaven. Let it rain. Let it rain. And open the portals of heaven. Oh, let it rain. Let it rain and open the portals of heaven.